You at some point may have encountered a player online with a full shiny team of Pokemon. After seething uncontrollably for the first minute of the match because you're just that jealous, you might wonder if there's any competitive advantage to running a full shiny team. Are the shiny hunters actually onto something? Are they wasting their time? Who knows? Well, not only is it sometimes optimal to run a full shiny team of Pokemon, but there are actually some strategies that require a full team of shinies to work. Today, let's talk about why shinies are optimal in competitive Pokemon. We'll also cover some examples of times you're at a disadvantage for running a shiny, but if you enjoyed this video at any point in time, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. As a matter of fact, if you think you're subscribed, do me a favor and double check because only half of my viewers are. And trust me, you'll want to be because I have a full playlist of videos just like this one for you to check out right after this. With that, let's get into it. So, shiny Pokemon are typically no different from regular Pokemon, other than that they have that cool little animation and a color change. However, Pokemon is a game of information, and hiding that information as much as possible is going to be essential for winning a match. And that's pretty much going to be the rule of thumb here. If you having a shiny hides information, it's optimal. If your shiny reveals information, you're playing at a disadvantage. Take for example the Gen 4 Legendary Beasts. Every single one of these dudes should always be ran as a shiny Pokemon in Gen 4. The year is 2011. Party Rock Anthem just came out, and while Pokemon Black and White is out in Japan, you don't live there, so it won't release for you until March. Fear not though, despite Gen 5 technically being out already, Gen 4 still has a round of event distributions releasing pretty soon. These are the Shiny Suicune with Sheer Cold, Air Slash, and Aqua Ring, Shiny Entei with Crush Caw, Flare Blitz, and Howl, and Shiny Raikou with Aura Sphere, Zap Cannon, and Weather Ball. Most of these are moves with super limited distribution and high potential for turning around a game. Well, not Crush Claw, that move actually kind of sucks. Luckily, all three of these guys also got access to Extreme Speed with this event, which is a move that Entei gets to take the most advantage of due to its high attack stat. And Suicune didn't get the short end of the stick either. I mean, Sheer Cold is literally an Oko move on a Pokemon as fat as that. You can click that move as much as you want. Keep on gambling, everybody! But these three were all massively influential Pokemon in both the VGC and Smogon singles with their new event moves. Suicune gaining access to Sheer Cold actually resulted in winning the 2010 Japan National Championships on Ryota Judy's team. Sheer Cold is a really powerful move on Suicune for the same reasons that Ting Lu sometimes runs Fissure in modern VGC. Its extremely high bulk combined with its middling offensive stats means that not only can it sit on the field for a very long period of time while supporting the team, but it has a ton of opportunities to just toss out a sheer cold and fish for that 30% chance to one-hit KO something. While players outside of Japan received this event Pokemon in 2011, Japanese players actually got it back in 2010, just days before this national championship took place. So this Pokemon practically came out of nowhere, with little time for anyone to adjust to its presence before the tournament. Along with Suicune came Entei. Now this is prior to Entei gaining access to Sacred Fire in Generation 6, so it relied on its event moves to be viable. Without access to Extreme Speed and Flare Blitz, Entei would be stuck clicking special fire attacks like Flamethrower or a weaker physical move like Fire Fang. It's due to these events that Entei was able to reach a level of viability that even allowed for it to be considered for teams. Mind the fact that it was only Yu Yu despite being a fairly strong physical fire type with Flare Blitz and extreme speed as a priority move. Without these options available, Entei wouldn't see much usage. Unfortunately, due to this Pokemon only becoming available in June 2010 and the World Championships coming very soon after, Entei failed to have a similar impact in VGC as Suicune did. It would eventually have its day in Generations 8 and 9 after gaining access to its hidden ability and inner focus, making it one of the more reliable physical attackers in the game. Finally, Raikou gained access to Aura Sphere, allowing for it to hit Rock and Steel types for super effective damage reliably. This combined with the likes of Calm Mind and its Stab Thunderbolt allowed for it to be a fairly strong electric type. It's currently tiered in UUBL in Gen 4, just below OU, but still banned from UU. Similar to Entei, it didn't have quite the time to make any impact on Gen 4 of HEC. While you could state that these moves themselves allowed for the Pokemon to be optimal, even if you're not running the moves, you'll still want your legendary beast to be shiny. This is because with closed team sheets back in Generation 4, having a shiny variant of these Pokemon means that the opponent will have to cover few possibly running the moves. If you don't run the shinies, the opponent immediately knows that Suicune can't spam Sheer Cold, Entei has no good fire stab, and Raikou can't hit steel types for super effective damage. Speaking of the Johto beasts, the Lake of Rage actually houses our next optimal shiny. Due to an event distribution in 2017, VGC players had to run shiny Gyarados on their teams. Normally, Gyarados Gyarados doesn't have access to any strong physical flying moves, or any real physical flying moves at all, meaning it might as well just be a pure water type at least on the offensive side of things. However, in 2017, there was an event distribution of a shiny Magikarp exclusive to stores in Taiwan, Malaysia, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Normally, this wouldn't be too big of a deal though, as bounce taking two turns to activate means it's easy to play around by just clicking protect on the turn it comes down to attack. This is why fly and dig are also not very commonly seen in VGC. But Gen 7 was the generation that introduced C moves, a mechanic which 
which turned one of your attacks into a super powerful generic version of it based off of the type. One of the most popular sets for Gyarados at the beginning of the format was Flyanium Z with Bounce. This move allowed for Gyarados to finally take on the grass types like Tapu Bulu, Lilligant, or Whimsicott, which would normally take negligible damage from a Gyarados. Once again, due to the closed team sheets, players could threaten a Flyanium Z Bounce just by having the Gyarados be the shiny variant. Even if they didn't run it though, forcing a grass type to protect a scout is a huge way to waste an opponent's turn. While moves can certainly be a huge reason for some shinies being better in competition, it should be noted that there are also some less straightforward reasons one might run a shiny Pokemon in a match. You see, whenever you send out a shiny Pokemon in the game, the extra time it takes for the game to play the animation of the stars coming off the Pokemon is a very valuable time waster. One of the win conditions that you can play for in VGC is the timer. Some games have a game timer as well as your time. You can win a match from your opponent running out of their personal timer by taking too much time to make decisions, or you can win by having more Pokemon by the time that the game timer runs out. The game timer doesn't stop for anything. In Generation 9, matches can only be a maximum of 20 minutes, meaning that at the end of those 20 minutes, the game counts up how many Pokemon each player has left and then decides the winner. Some teams' best chances of beating another popular archetype could be to win off of the timer. This was actually a way some players had to beat Shedinja in restricted formats, because Shedinja functioned as a win condition for teams by being an unkillable Pokemon once the opponent lost certain pieces, some players ran full shiny teams as a way to more reliably timer stall against a Shedinja in the endgame. Finally, some of the funnier examples of ways shinies are optimal rely mostly on your opponents being either gullible or not doing their due diligence. Shiny Tatsugiri is technically optimal against bad players. Tatsugiri's ability commander allows for it to enter Dondozo's mouth once they're both active on the field, granting Dondozo a plus two boost in all of its stats. Dondozo also has a signature move called Order Up. This move boosts either Dondozo's attack, defense, or speed, depending on the form of Tatsugiri it has in its mouth. Knowing what boost a Dondozo can go for is essential for playing against it. Everyone worth their salt in VGC knows what forms boost what, but running a shiny Tatsugiri, you have the opportunity to cause your opponent to just not know what shiny corresponds to what form. Luckily, a smart player will just check the opponent's team with either the plus button or the team sheet in front of them. But in high stress situations or versus worse players, they might not think of this in the moment and make a disadvantageous play. And this one's more of a joke, but back in generation 6 and 7s with Mega, Charizard was granted two different Mega Evolutions which played entirely differently. Shiny Charizard X's shiny was actually kind of garbage looking, it wasn't that cool, but Shiny Charizard Y's shiny was pretty sick. So if you ran a Shiny Charizard, you might be able to trick your opponents into thinking you were running Zard Y over Zard X, since who would bother going for the Shiny Charizard X, am I right? As a side note, someone once ran Charizard Y, but put a Charizard X plushie on the table in front of them. This mind game undoubtedly won them some matches. You might want to immediately jump to run shiny Pokemon on your team because of what you've heard today, but you should be warned. There are some exceptions to this rule. Like I said, you want to make sure that above all else, you're hiding information. For that reason, these Pokemon are much worse as shinies. Shiny Heatran was worse than regular Heatran due to Pokemon Ranger. If you captured a Heatran from Pokemon Ranger and transferred it to a Generation 4 game, it would always be a quiet nature with the exclusive move of Eruption. Eruption was a powerful option as off of Heatran's massive special attack stat, this could reliably pick up KOs if it was at full HP. Since Heatran couldn't be shiny in Pokemon Ranger, a shiny Heatran would indicate to your opponent that you couldn't possibly have access to Eruption. This not only eliminated the possibility of the move, but could also be an indicator of item, since Eruption was pretty popular on choice spec sets in OU. While he Eruption Heatran was locked to a particular nature, this was a minor disadvantage compared to the benefit of bluffing Eruption. Unlike Tapu Koko, who should never be ran as a shiny in Generation 7. This is because Tapu Koko was shiny locked outside of its distribution in 2017. However, this event Tapu Koko would would always be a timid nature. Tapu Koko could run a variety of natures due to its stats, from timid to modest, to jolly, adamant, or even hasty in some pretty fringe cases. Due to the shiny immediately revealing the nature, in Generation 7, Tapu Koko should never be ran as that shiny. The funny thing about this is that all of the other Tapus were released as shinies through an event, but they were able to have whatever nature you wanted. So Tapu Koko was the only shiny you'd never see among the quartet in competitive. Another Electrotype that shouldn't be ran as a shiny is Gen 3 Zapdos. Zapdos in Pokemon X XD Gale of Darkness was obtainable as a Shadow Pokemon. Upon purification, it would gain Baton Pass. But since Shadow Pokemon can't be shiny in the game, a shiny Zapdos immediately removes this possibility of having Baton Pass on your set. Now that I think about it, most of the suboptimal shinies are actually electric types for some reason. In fact, back in Generation 6, there was an all-electric type tournament where the Pokemon Company offered a special prize if Pikachu reached a certain level of usage among players, with the highest usage goal getting players access to an event Pikachu with an exclusive move. This ended up being the move Endeavor, a move which allowed Pikachu to immediately cut the target's HP to be equal to itself, 
By evolving this event Pikachu into a Raichu and combining it with a Focus Sash, or just a set built to barely tank a hit, Raichu could seriously chunk some teams. This specific Raichu even won the 2016 World Championships on Wolf Glick's team. It was an Assault Vest set built to tank a hit from the likes of Kyogre, then have a partner like Rayquaza pick it off after the Endeavor. Finally, the last of the suboptimal shinies that we'll cover today is Greninja, possibly the most well-known one, as when I reached out to get info about this topic, 99% of the replies were this specific example. I get it, it can't be shiny and optimal, okay? I get it, look at all these comments, I got so many replies, it was insane. Greninja in Gen 7 had access to the ability Battle Bond. Upon scoring KO, this ability would transform it into Ash Greninja, getting a massive boost in stats and a passive increase on the power of Water Shuriken. While not legal in VGC ever, it was insanely powerful in Gen 7 OU as a choice spec sweeper. Unfortunately, as this was a gift for playing the Pokemon Sun and Moon demo, it was never available as a shiny. So by running Shiny Greninja, you were basically screaming, I'm not Battle Bond, I'm not Battle Bond. But those are the reasons that Shinies are optimal in competitive play, as well as the few examples of Shiny Pokemon that you really shouldn't run. But what do you think? Are you gonna start running an all Shiny team to run out the clock? Or are you not a total sweat? Let me know in the comment section down below. And if you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. A special thank you to all my Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members. If you want to see your name at the end of my videos and get access to exclusive bonus content like sneak peeks of future videos, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button below or become a Patreon by clicking the link in the description. And as always, a special thank you to my most boosted supporters, Avatar67, Kanor, Joseph Harridge, Halo, and Narwiz for their very generous pledges. You should see a playlist on screen in a second with tons of other videos like this that I'd really appreciate you checking out. Thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye!